March 1941. Mare Island Naval Shipyard, Vallejo, California. The welding torch flickered against the cold steel hull of a submarine still months from launch. Shadows from cranes and scaffold frames stretched across the construction bay like the ribs of some massive industrial beast. The air smelled of hot metal, sawdust, and sweat. Sparks popped against the floor as welders pressed on through another 12-hour shift. Among them moved a man whose frustration was growing by the day. Theodore Edward Nelson, 36 years old, wiry, dark-haired, and carrying the quiet intensity of someone who'd spent 15 years solving problems with his hands, paused to wipe sweat from his brow. He pulled a small notebook from his back pocket and jotted a line that had become a mantra. There has to be a better way. This is madness. Nelson had watched the same ritual repeat itself for months. The same inefficiency, the same waste, the same refusal to change. For a yard that would soon be central to America's submarine fleet, progress was moving at a pace that felt almost medieval. He moved beneath the wooden decking of a submarine under construction. Above him, workers hammered, drilled, and maneuvered planks into position. Below him, a forest of scaffolding choked the walkway. Workers contorting their bodies in tight metal compartments to twist nuts onto bolts pushed through the deck above. The process was slow, painfully slow. Hours poured into a single stretch of deck. Days were consumed to finish a few sections. Valuable manpower was trapped in a job that should have been simple. And yet, this was standard procedure. The Navy supervisors insisted nothing needed a change. Theodore, Ted, Nelson wasn't a complainer by nature. He'd spent most of his life learning the mechanics of how things worked. Machine shops up and down California had shaped him. San Diego, Stockton, Bakersfield, Oakland. He'd learned metallurgy, shop mathematics, early electrical engineering. Everything a self-taught mechanic could absorb. But this, this waste of time and human effort, was unbearable. Through the 1930s and into the early years of World War II, the U.S. Navy still relied on a method for attaching wooden decks that dated back to World War I. It was a method rooted in tradition, not efficiency. Each wooden plank required a series of precisely drilled and countersunk holes. The plank was positioned on the steel frame. Then, massive scaffolds were erected below the deck, giving workers just enough room to squeeze and with wrenches to tighten nuts onto bolts protruding from above. Thousands of bolts, thousands of nuts, all tightened by hand, all hidden beneath layers of wood plugs hammered into place. A single submarine deck required between 12 and 16 men working for five to seven days. And this was only one deck of many. The scaffolding alone, two days to build, one day to tear down. Nelson watched it daily, shaking his head. War was coming. Time was running out. And American shipyards were still using methods that would have felt old-fashioned during the Spanish-American War. What infuriated him even more was how simple the solution was. Stud, welding existed. In principle, it was simple. Weld a small steel rod or stud directly to the surface, providing a point where anything could be attached quickly. No drilling. No bolts. No nuts. No scaffolding. The problem? Stud. Welding only worked on horizontal surfaces. The key ingredient, flux powder used to stabilize a weld, would fall off if the stud wasn't placed straight downward. This limitation had frustrated engineers for decades. The technology had promise, but nobody had cracked the code to make it work overhead vertically or at odd angles inside a submarine. Ted Nelson saw the flaw and the solution. What the flux powder didn't sit loosely on the stud. What if it were encased? What if the stud itself carried a small ceramic cap, a disposable cover that would hold the flux in place, no matter the angle? The idea hit him like a hammer on steel. He sketched rapidly. A handheld gun with a spring-loaded stud holder, an electrical trigger, and a ceramic-coated stud that could be fired into place and welded in a fraction of a second. It would be faster. It would eliminate scaffolding. It would allow one man to do the work of ten. It would change naval construction forever. There was only one problem. Nobody believed him. Ted brought his sketches to his supervisor, Lieutenant Morrison, a career Navy man who favored procedure above innovation. Morrison glanced at the drawings and spoke without looking up. 
Mr. Nelson, we have established procedures. Follow Navy specifications. There was nothing more to discuss. Ted tried again, this time with the chief welding engineer, Hartwell, a man known for shutting down unconventional ideas. Hartwell examined the ceramic cap sketch and chuckled politely. People far smarter than us have tried this. If it were possible, somebody would have solved it long ago. A formal suggestion to the shipyard commander was returned with a form letter stamped in blue ink. Engineering review estimated to take 18 to 24 months. Ted stared at the paper, jaw clenched. By the time the Navy reviewed his idea, the war might be lost. That night, he made the most important decision of his life. If the Navy won't test my invention, I will. Ted cleared space in his garage. His wife, Emma, watched nervously. He worked nights, weekends, early mornings. Scrap metal piled in the corner. Tools littered the floor. The prototype evolved piece by piece. A pistol-style grip. A spring-loaded stud chamber. An electrical trigger. Interchangeable heads. And the breakthrough, the ceramic flux cap. He tested each iteration on metal plate after metal plate. Horizontal. Vertical. Sideways. Upside down. Each weld held. He could create a perfect high-string stud weld in under one second. Even overhead. Even upside down in a submarine steel compartment. Even where no human hand could reach a bolt. Word spread among co-workers. They gathered in his garage to watch demonstrations. Some encouraged him to quit the Navy Yard and start his own company. You'll make a fortune, Ted. This will change everything. You need to patent this. Ted resisted. It wasn't about money. It was about solving a problem America desperately needed solved. But as the weeks passed, something became clear. The Navy would never test his invention unless he forced him to see it. On June 20th, 1941, after years in the shipyard, he walked into his supervisor's office with a resignation letter. Morrison looked up, surprised. You're making a mistake, Nelson. Ted, simply replied. When the Navy comes back asking to buy my invention, remember this conversation. He left with $11 in his pocket. July 1st, 1941. San Leandro, California. Ted Nelson founded the Nelson Specialty Welding Equipment Corporation, funded through a $95,000 loan from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, money intended to boost industrial capacity as America prepared for war. He rented a modest workshop and began manufacturing his stud welding guns by hand. At first, orders were slow. Shipyards were cautious, conservative, reluctant to adopt new technology. Even during wartime, innovation felt risky. Then came the morning that changed American history. December 7, 1941. Everything changes. The attack on Pearl Harbor launched America into World War II. Almost overnight, every shipyard in the nation was overwhelmed. Production quotas surged. Emergency contracts flooded in. The U.S. Navy realized it needed to build faster, safer, smarter. Suddenly, every yard was desperate for any technology that could save time. Ted's phone began ringing. Kaiser Shipyards ordered 50 guns. Bethlehem Steel ordered 40. Even Mayor Island, his old employer, placed an order for 60. By early 1942, demand outpaced his production capacity. Ted expanded his San Leandro facility hiring additional machinists, welders, and engineers. By year's end, his company employed 150 workers producing, 30 stud welding guns per day, thousands of ceramic cap studs, replacement parts for shipyard maintenance teams. Where it once took nearly a week to install decks, yards now did it in one day. Stud welding gun operators could attach thousands of studs in the time it once took to attach a few dozen bolts. Shipyards reported time saving so dramatic that engineers initially refused to believe the numbers. But the results were real and undeniable. The Navy returns. November 19, 1942. A convoy of Navy officers arrived at Ted Nelson's factory. They conducted extensive tests. They measured weld strength, speed, and reliability. They replicated shipyard conditions, overhead, vertical, cramped compartments, every angle imaginable. The verdict was unanimous. 
Nelson's invention was superior to every previous method. An officer, speaking for the Bureau of Ships, delivered the news that stunned even Ted. In the past ten months, your invention has already saved the Navy more than five million man-hours. Five million hours. In less than a year. And this was only the beginning. Navy forecasts estimated that stud welding could save more than 50 million man-hours over the course of the war. The officers formally apologized for rejecting him. Ted nodded politely, but inside he knew the truth. If he hadn't quit the Navy Yard, none of this would have happened. War Yard Expansion By 1943, Ted opened a second factory in Camden, New Jersey, to meet demand along the East Coast. His workforce grew to over 400. His annual revenue hit $4 million, a staggering figure for a company only two years old. Yet Ted never changed. He wore the same shop clothes, worked 16-hour shifts, paid himself modestly, reinvesting everything into production. Stud, welding revolutionized, submarine decks, destroyer and carrier decks, bulkhead attachments, electrical cable mounts, pipe supports, hull internal structures, army tank production, aircraft assembly lines, bridge construction. Everywhere a boat was used, a stud could replace it faster, stronger, cheaper. America's wartime construction boom. Ships, tanks, planes, factories ran faster because of one simple innovation born in a garage. The legacy of a welder who wouldn't give up. By the end of World War II, Nelson's technology had become standard across all branches of U.S. industry. His company continued to grow, eventually becoming the world leader in stud welding solutions. But Ted always saw himself the same way. Not as a CEO. Not as an inventor. Not as a wealthy industrialist. He was a welder. A problem solver. A man who refused to accept waste when he could see a better way. His invention, the Nelson Stud Welding Gun, is still used around the world today. In shipyards, skyscrapers, pipeline construction, automobile factories, and military installations. Billions of studs have been welded since his first garage prototype sparked to life. And the U.S. Navy, once slow to embrace his idea, ultimately credited him with saving more than 50 million man-hours, accelerating war production at one of the most critical moments in American history. Ted Nelson lived long enough to see his technology adopted globally, but he never stopped working, never stopped tinkering, never stopped refining his ideas. To the men who served on the submarines, destroyers, carriers, and landing craft built during the war, Nelson's invention was invisible, buried beneath decks and hull structures. But history knows better. One man, armed with nothing more than a notebook, a garage, and relentless determination, helped change the course of naval engineering. A welder, a thinker, a pioneer, the forgotten American who revolutionized shipbuilding, Theodore Edward Nelson.